Chrono Trigger, a necessity for gracious living. Often heralded as simply one of the greatest games ever made, Chrono Trigger is a 1995 Super Nintendo Japanese role-playing game that would break all sorts of new grounds. Produced by a literal dream team, Chrono Trigger was not only developed and published by one of the kings of RPGs in the form of Squaresoft, but this legendary game was a joint creation of Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi, Dragon Quest creator Yuji Horii of Enix, and would even have character design by Akira Toriyama, the author of the amazing Dragon Ball manga series. The title had all the right ingredients to be potentially something special, and my God, was it so. Chrono Trigger is one of those rare instances where the end product truly did live up to the hype, delivering perhaps the most detailed game in the genre that the world had seen yet, with this huge game pushing the aged Super Nintendo to its very limits. While this was the case, then it may likely come as a surprise to you today that there wasn't just a Chrono Trigger game made for Nintendo's 16-bit hardware, but also their earlier 8-bit hardware as well. So, without further ado, I am Lady Decade and this is the story of the illegal 8-bit version of Chrono Trigger for the NES. As covered on this channel in many videos in the past, Nintendo ditched their 8-bit home console to provide all of their support to later generations of hardware, whereas bootleggers in both China and Taiwan would continue to pump out games for the dated technology. This was in part due to the huge Famiclone market that existed in the developing world. Famiclone hardware had been widely distributed, leading to a massive demand for titles in regions whereby Nintendo had little in the way of an official presence. In the era where, in some parts of the world, gamers were enjoying the likes of the Nintendo 64 and Sony PlayStation, in other parts they were only just experiencing 8-bit console gaming for the first time. So, with all of this going on, bootleggers would constantly look for inspiration from what games were selling amazingly in Western Europe, North America and Japan, and look to create insane 8-bit demakes. The cheeky buggers. On this channel, we have now looked at many of these. Super Mario World, A Link to the Past, Sonic the Hedgehog, Street Fighter 2 and Donkey Kong Country, just to name a few. Insanely, we've also covered even a version of Final Fantasy VII created to run on the Famiclones. Mental Final Fantasy VII, which was later refined even further by the hacking and modding fan community, is a top-notch effort, with the results garnering an extremely impressive experience. Condensing the entire story of Final Fantasy VII into almost unbelievable 8-bit form. If I hadn't seen this game running with my own eyes, I probably wouldn't have even believed it existed. But if talented people could do this with this game, then that surely doesn't make recreating a rudimentary version of Chrono Trigger outside the realms of possibility either, right? So who would make an 8-bit Chrono Trigger and was it any good? Released at some point after 1996, a Chrono Trigger backport would be created under the title of Shi Kong Ji Lun, with, rather unsurprisingly, the bootleg use of the Chrono Trigger license being used in China. The Chinese game was made by the Shenzhen Nanjing Technology Company, an entity that we have mentioned in the past on here, as not only did they create The Legend of Zelda Minish Cap JRPG bootleg that we looked at previously, but also the Final Fantasy VII game we have just highlighted. The company would become synonymous with specifically creating Chinese language RPGs, using popular established licenses with tons of dodgy Pokemon games being amongst their gaming repertoire. 
Most of these releases share key elements, and with many being developed using the same engine, this in many cases will mean that game mechanics often drift quite far from the source material. With Minish Cap, for example, becoming turn-based instead of an action game. But what did Chrono Trigger have in store for us? Those who have played the 1995 classic will instantly note the similarities between this Chinese bootleg and the original. With the game opening dialogue and stroll towards the Millennial Fair and teleportation device echoing back to what we are familiar with. It is of note though that the fair is bleak in comparison to the official version, but at least it's easy to tell what is going on with the game's big bold character sprites providing decent representation for each character. But things don't hold together this well for very long. It's only a matter of time until the player is thrust into their first battle, with one of the key features of Chrono Trigger being missing from this game. Perhaps one of the 16-bit game's coolest features was that not only could you see enemies approaching in the game rather than them appearing in random encounters, but when you did do battle with them, there would be a swirly transitions, the likes of which you see in Pokemon and Final Fantasy. But instead, turn-based battle scenes would commence seamlessly. Basically, contact with enemies on a field map in the official version initiates a battle that occurs directly on the map, rather than on a separate battle screen, a feature that was cutting edge at the time and completely absent from the NES version. Chrono Trigger uses an active time battle system, a recurring element of Square's Final Fantasy game series, which was designed by Hiroyuki Ito for Final Fantasy IV. But the bootleg, on the other hand, simply uses the same battle system found within many Shenzhen Nanjing technology games, which I must say is a bit underwhelming. This battle system sadly isn't implemented particularly well at all, but at least it has a gauge allowing for an active time battle, providing at least a dash of authenticity to the source material. But here is where things get hilarious. Rather than simply try and create the most accurate Chrono Trigger experience possible, it's only a matter of time before you start noticing a lot of hilarious programming laziness slipping in. In your active time encounters, you quickly find yourself facing off against Pokemon, such as Rhyhorn. The Chinese pirates took assets from some of their earlier projects and, for ease of use, just chucked them into Chrono Trigger, delivering, in my opinion, shameless yet comical results. As soon as you notice this, you will notice a bunch of other assets pinched from Pokemon 2, such as all of the game's trees, for example. The copying and pasting knows no bounds, which is further emphasised as Chrono slashes down a haunter. What is this game? People who have eyes, which are used for seeing, will also note that inns in the game are just clearly manufactured. Pokemon centers, with even bloody PCs being present next to the reception desk. I guess at least this Chinese company are not letting empty properties go to waste and are instead repurposing them for other functions. Now, we have already mentioned fighting Pokemon in this game, but what is even more hilarious is that the developers seem to have taken it upon themselves too in some cases, take parts of Pokemon and then splice them together with others. I mean, what even is this Chimera-like abomination? As you progress, not all of the enemies are so Pokemon-centric, and the game does do an okay point of following the Chrono Trigger plot. Experienced gamers will also note that a whole area from the game seems to have been built using elements from the tower from Lavender Town from Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. 
Some parts of the game are more accurate than others, with the enemies in the prehistoric chapter of the title, for example, being way more faithful to the 16-bit Chrono Trigger. Still, the more you walk around this game, the more you realise it is just a bootleg Pokemon game that has been rejigged a bit to look a bit more like Chrono Trigger. But it is awesome that this novelty exists regardless. Tragically, I have to inform you that unfortunately the game does not tell the entire tale of Chrono Trigger either, with the game instead concluding after your battle with Magus. Meaning only part of the 16-bit classic was demade for the NES. There's not much more really to add, but one thing is for sure, this exists. Now, with an obscurity existing like this, it would be easy to assume that the game can only be experienced in Chinese, but fortunately, Pack and Sack Games, the kind soul who has graciously translated a lot of these weird bootlegs into English, has provided the same love and attention to this one. So you can enjoy the madness that this questionable title exudes in all its glory with full English text. Bloody ridiculous, but bloody amazing. So, through making this video, I can't really say this is a game that you should rush out to play if you are looking for an accurate 8-bit demake made with love, care and attention. However, if you are looking for a shameless, hilarious bootleg that has been manifested as quickly as possible using every game asset available at a pirate's disposal, then this is the dubious game for you. So I am Lady Decade and that was the story of the illegal 8-bit version of Chrono Trigger for the NES. And if you enjoyed this content then like, subscribe, hit the notification bell and tell all of your friends and family about my wonderful content that you love so much that you got my name tattooed inside of a love heart on your bicep. So this video was filmed in front of my live studio audience over on Twitch. So hello everybody who is watching me right now. As is usual, at the end of my videos, I like to answer questions from my patrons. So today's question is from Boyd Chan and he asks, Sega Dreamcast, Nintendo GameCube, Sony PlayStation 2 and Microsoft Xbox. If you had to, would you well, if you had to keep one, crush one, gift one to a friend, and give one to your worst enemy, which of these consoles would you allocate? So, for me, I would keep the Sony PlayStation 2. And my reason for that is, out of all of our collections of games, we have got the most games for the Sony PlayStation 2. I would have endless options to play um, if I keep the PlayStation 2. I would crush the uh, Nintendo GameCube and my reason for that is because it will upset a lot of people, a lot of very passionate people who think there is more to the GameCube than its handbag handle. It basically, it, it looks like a handbag, doesn't it? You can just carry it around and swing it around your finger if you wanted to. Very flamboyant. Um, I would gift the Sega Dreamcast to a friend because I don't think anyone will disagree with the fact that the the Dreamcast is top quality but it just doesn't have enough games on the system to want to tempt me away from the Sony PlayStation 2 and I would gift the X well the Xbox to my worst enemy specifically with the Duke controller and then hope that they really 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 want to watch a DVD so that they have to go and source a remote control to do that. So if you would like your question answered at the end of one of my videos then please consider backing my little channel over on Patreon and if you're about on Twitch on a Wednesday night then hop over I'll probably be live at some point that evening depending on my children um, to do this filming. And also, um, just thank you all for sticking around until this point in the video, and I shall see you all next time.